Our third speaker, uh, Ambassador Arif Ayub, a person with uh, very major experience. Ambassador Arif Ayub is currently president of the Institute of Regional Studies, Islamabad, since 2014. The institute was established in 1982 and specializes in research in South Asian issues, focusing mainly on India. Ambassador Arif Ayub served as ambassador to Netherlands, Egypt, Afghanistan, and Italy. Previously, he had served as the SAC Secretary at Kathmandu as director from Pakistan, the Pakistan mission to the UN, New York as counselor, the Embassy of Pakistan, Italy as first secretary, and Embassy of Pakistan, Romania as second secretary. At the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he, he has served as Director General, Director General Central, Director General UN, Director General Central Asia, Director General Africa, Director Afghanistan, Section Office Afghanistan. He learned Russian at the Institute of Modern Languages, Islamabad, and joined the Foreign Service Pakistan in 1973. He graduated from London School of Economics with BSc Economics and had earlier studied at the University of Islamabad, Gordon College, and St. Mary's Academy at Rawalpindi. Ambassador Ayub is a very experienced diplomat, as you can see from his uh, CV, and he has in-depth knowledge about, I believe, Afghanistan as well. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would also like to thank the commander of the Sri Lanka Army for giving the Institute of Regional Studies the privilege and honor of addressing Defense Seminar 2014 on the theme, Pakistan and the Rise of Asia in the Region. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan essentially comprises the Indus Valley and the Indus Valley civilization is thought to be one of the earliest civilizations of humankind. According to French and Italian archaeologists, the Mergar Neolithic ruins near Sibi have been carbon dated to 7000 BC. This fact exhibits the crucial role the Indus Valley has played through centuries as a transmitter of civilization between West Asia and Central Asia and South Asia. The list of invaders to this fertile and historic area is long, but these invasions also opened up and reinforced a number of trade routes linking Northwest India to the Mediterranean and China. In the words of Toynbee, the area comprising Pakistan and Afghanistan became the roundabout of trade routes and the crossroads of civilization. The 21st century, which is sometimes described as the Asian century, is being shaped by the post-Cold War dynamics with ascendancy of geoeconomics and the phenomenon of globalization spurred by information and technological revolutions and manifest in unprecedented global interaction. A most distinct feature is regional cooperation for accelerated trade and economic development. As a consequence, imperatives of geoeconomics appear to override geopolitical tensions. With the end of the Cold War and the bipolar world, confrontational politics at the global level have subsided, giving way to competition and cooperation among great powers in today's steadily emerging multipo multipolar world. On the whole, these developments are unlikely to reverse the trends for trade and economic cooperation set over the past three decades that have transformed many regions in the world, especially East Asia and Southeast Asia, into engines of global economic growth. Geoeconomics has a powerful and inexorable logic. This coupled with the inspiration of building knowledge-based societies augurs well for Asia. The Asian development has altered the political landscape of the world. If we compare with the world situation on the eve of the 20th century, 
what we witnessed today was unthinkable then. The change is not just spectacular, it has by any measure brought about a better world order which is more equitable, more prosperous, and more participatory. Thus describing the current century as the Asian century is justified. Turning to South Asia, there is little doubt that the region has made progress. Economic growth rates have been considerable, in particular of India, which has become a leading economy in the world. Despite problems, Pakistan also showed consistent growth for many years in the last decade. However, regional cooperation, especially within the framework of SARC, leaves much to be desired. This is more poignant when we compare progress made by other regional organizations such as ASEAN, GCC, or Mercosur. Figures for inter-regional trade are telltale. According to an estimate, the intra-regional trade within SARC region is less than 5% of its total trade. Compare this figure to 20% among members of ASEAN and 15% among Mercosur members and 50% among countries of East Asia, including Southeast Asia, and 20% among countries of Latin America. The figures point to both the potential and the problems that need to be overcome. South Asia faces serious challenges that depend on the regional cooperation for their alleviation and redress. Social indicators in the region are among the lowest in the world despite the resources and resourcefulness of the South Asian people. However, the energy sector opens new and exciting prospects of cooperation that can benefit the entire region. It would require an infrastructure of not only transmission lines, but public and private sector arrangements between buyers and sellers. The resulting interdependence and positive dividends for better confidence and understanding are obvious. Since the establishment of a technical committee on energy in January 2000, there have been technical and high-level meetings to consider broad-ranging intra-regional cooperation for promoting energy trade within SARC to developing renewable energy resources. A SARC energy center has been established in Islamabad to act as a catalyst for collective activities on energy. It has developed a comprehensive, ambitious plan for program activities. However, traction in this sector will depend on implementation of concrete projects and private-public sector involvement with active official facilitation. Connectivity encompassing road and rail links, telecommunications, and travel is a much-discussed subject. It is without doubt an essential feature of regional and economic growth. In the light of a SARC regional multimodal transport study prepared with ADB funding, an intergovernment group recommended the SARC Secretariat to develop draft regional agreements on transport and transit railways and framework for multimodal transport operations. It will be naive to overlook impediments, but if we remain daunted by them, we risk losing opportunities that states have seized in other regions. Over three decades, SARC has built a body of thought and institutional network. It provides the most valuable forum for its leadership to discuss both SARC-related and other vital political, bilateral, and international issues. There is awareness of benefits of cooperation and willingness to move forward. We need to operationalize these ideas to transform SARC into a vibrant organization worthy of the shared history, heritage, and culture in our region. In Pakistan and India, what we are seeing is a commitment and will by the two neighbors to seriously work on a sustainable process of Indo-Pak trade liberalization, reflecting a realization by both India and Pakistan that an enhancement of economic cooperation not only lies the key to resolving their long-standing issues, but also the opportunity for realizing their true economic potential. Um, on the global level, uh, protectionism, according to Lawrence and Edwards, is a high-cost option in an independent environment, and the socialist countries of the post-World War II era learned this the hard way. 
ultimately enhanced competitiveness leads to increase in exports of the country who shun protectionism. Paul Krugman also explained that um, when trade barriers fall and trade increases, firms gain access to bigger markets, allowing them to expand production and reap economies of scale. But at the same time, openness also exposes them to competition. Some firms may go out of business, however, the domestic survivors and the foreign entrants <coughs> means that people still have more to choose from. Thus, the gains from trade arise not only from specialization, but from scale economics, fiercer competition, and an increased choice that globalization provides. So far as uh, Pakistan is concerned, we envisage um, increased linkages with the government of the People's Republic of China to enhance connectivity in the region. The Karakuram Highway built in 1979 by the government of China and the Frontier Works Organization connects Pakistan to China through the Khunjara Pass, the highest paved international road in the world. Currently, the Chinese government is extending the width of the road from 10 meters to 30 meters, which would link up through Islamabad with the national highways leading to the ports of Karachi and Gwadar. Pakistan would therefore be linked through both the land and maritime routes of the Silk Road, known as the Littoral System. However, um, in the case of uh, Pak China trade, the cost of sea trade has been estimated to be seven times cheaper than the land route. Because the uh, additional problem with the Karakoram Highway is that because of the height of the Karakoram Pass, the route is closed for six months of winter, while diesel trucks have difficulty operating and have to reduce their load by 30%. And the best uh, alternative route is through the all-weather road linking Quetta to Kandahar, Herat, and the Central Asian states, as mentioned by Mariam. In the case of Pakistan, however, much more needs to be done to streamline the system at the border crossings at Chaman, Torkham, and Waga. The World Bank in its latest logistic performance index has graded Pakistan as 72 out of 166 countries, compared to China at 28. There is therefore a need to remove the restrictions that have led to this unsatisfactory state of affairs. It is not merely a system of improvement of the logistics infrastructure. The multiplicity of agencies at the border needs to be streamlined and the agreements under which trade is taking place needs to be refocused towards enhancing trade rather than creating hurdles and barriers. This includes reduction of tariffs and non-tariff barriers, service liberalization, trade facilitation, improved regulatory regimes, and transparent border clearance procedures. The remarkable achievements in the last few decades by China and India as soon as they discarded their import substitution models of development are the list of examples of advantages of following the export-oriented policies of liberalization, privatization, market freedoms, and the embrace of globalization as the only route to prosperity. As a result, forecasts of GDP growth show that China would attain its traditional historical share of 30% of world GDP by 2020, restoring its traditional civilizational role as the world's largest economy. Following the FTA between Pakistan and China, bilateral trade increased to over $12 billion, but it needs to be replicated with other regional countries to enhance regional connectivity. Uh, with regard to Gwadar too, despite a passage of six years, there are still problems of logistics and connectivity, both with the internal highways and the literal system. In addition, the provision of electricity and railway links are still on the drawing board. Hopefully, with the transfer of the operation of the port to the China Overseas Port Holding Company in 2013, the functionality and connectivity of Gwadar as a transit and transshipment hub would soon be achieved. Pakistan will become, with the assistance of the government of China, the connecting bridge of north, south, and east, west in the region, and play a pivotal role in regional connectivity and development. 
The government of China is also involved in the construction of the Lahore Karachi motorway and 800 long um, fiber optic cabling along the KKH that will connect Pakistan and Trans Asia Europe cable in China. As part of the Park China Economic Corridor, both Pakistan and China would also be studying the feasibility of electricity links and oil and gas pipelines along the KKH. And the total investment involved is uh, about uh, $30 billion in industrial and hydroelectric projects along the KKH, leading to a multiplicity of um, connections aimed at revitalizing the Silk Road for the mutual benefit of the region. On the regional level, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Economic Cooperation Organization are already cooperating in examining the feasibility of relevant links between ECO countries and uh, Urumqi. This needs to be extended to include SARC countries in order to ensure extended regional cooperation and enhance connectivity. The global economic center of gravity is shifting towards Asia and the countries need to prepare the necessary infrastructure to take advantage of this opportunity. The initiative by the government of the People's Republic of China on the restructuring of the Silk Road is therefore an important step towards the integration of the region for mutual benefit. Thank you.